Yeah, I mean, I suppose the the first um, the first part of the question is what how do I feel about that old stuff? Um, what the what the emotional connection is to it? Um, the first the first electronic piece that I made the relationship to that old stuff um, was ambivalent at best um, and maybe even kind of negative negative. Um, and it was um, I even talked about it as being like a, a reclamation project um, a way of like taking this thing that I had made that I wasn't really happy with and somehow trying to make something that I was happy with um, but that's not the case for um, for this project so you know a lot of those a lot of the pieces a lot of the recordings that I was working with um, uh, actually it was this was more a kind of honoring of of a kind of um, of a tradition um, so so you know we were talking earlier about um, you know where this sits in the in a kind of body of work like where it sits in in the history of my of my practice and um, and this was a way of kind of acknowledging um, the the importance well um, the importance of these particular players um, that was really important so all of the recordings that I was working with are older pieces but specifically they're pieces that were either written for members of Elysian or performed by members of Elysian and so it was a kind of um, acknowledgement um, a kind of honoring of of the the role that um, that those people um, those human beings have played in um, in the work um, I, I do kind of realize that then absolutely obliterating those recordings doesn't seem like an honoring. But it was a way of, of um, I guess it was a way of kind of pivoting to, uh, to sort of acknowledge that this wasn't entirely a break with what I had done before, but a way of like repurposing what I had done before. And that's true, um, that's true not just in the, in the electronic material where there is this kind of direct repurposing of, of um, recordings older recordings found uh, as found material um, but even in the notated material across the project um, so I set myself this task that I wasn't allowed to do anything I already knew how to do um, that the the project had to be a kind of um, you know, a kind of clean slate um, in terms of methodology um, and even to a certain extent in terms of intention and one of the things that's been really interesting for me is just how much of my old approach ha has carried through. So in this effort to to make this intentional severing with where I started, um, or you know the, where what I what I kind of knew how to do already, a, a kind of existing practice, um, all of these um, approaches to instruments, ways of thinking about gesture, ways of thinking about. Um, even to a certain extent, the the um, rhythmic identities of, of gestures, like all of that stuff, of course, carries carries over. So, um, so I guess both with in the, in the electronic music and in the the notated music, uh, acoustic or otherwise, um, that the whole project has been in some ways about, um, uh, let's say, like a, it was a stock taking. It was. Um, not it wasn't about severing it was about okay this, I've done I've done this work which has gotten me this far in order to go on um, I'm gonna have to do something different um, but I, I still have to kind of acknowledge the the can of worms that my previous work had opened um, so. I want to talk a bit about your identity as a experimental composer yeah you wanted to draw a distinction between um, yourself as a composer of experimental music and an experimental composer in that you don't go into a compositional process with a preconceived idea of what would come out yeah. at the end. Um, with this new set of material, uh, that's still true. You yeah. don't know what's going to come out, yeah. but uh, there's something guided in this one, whereas in the other ones it was more like uh, the large hydron collider, yeah. you know, whatever yeah. comes out. Yeah. So, so, in terms of uh, that identity, an experimental composer, would you say that this as an experiment is comparable to your former experiments of the past, or is this a new hat? Like a experimental composer 2.0. You know? Right, 
Um, that, that's a really hard question for me to answer. Um, uh, because there's, there's what, I've, what I've realized, say, after the first performance of the full ensemble piece um, back in September, and then some performances of some of the subsidiary um, standalone works. Um, what I set out to do and what I've actually done aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, so I would say that what I set out to do was not um, experimental composer 2.0, um, as you put it. Um, I set out to make a really great piece um, and a piece that worked um, the first time <laughs> and that was really impressive on first listening, which is something that I'm not sure I've ever done before. And um, um, and first of all, I'm not sure that that was successful. Um, but then, I guess more more to the point, I'm really interested in the fact that I ended up writing an experimental piece in 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 the end, like despite myself. Um, so, um, a lot of the things that I built into the piece that I thought were going to make. Um, materials speak more directly, um, I thought would be more transparent and more direct and more communicative in their notation for the players, um, ways of dealing with kind of large scale organization of, of materials. Like I thought all of that was um, much more streamlined and much more focused and frankly much more, um, let's say evocative um, and maybe even say uh, conventionally expressive in their materials rather than being kind of emergent um, in their expressivity, which I think is probably how my my earlier work tends to tends to operate, um, and all of those things that I thought that I was doing that were more direct and and um, and more transparent, a lot of those are the things that didn't work, or, or at least caused problems, or were challenges to the players, or things that didn't quite speak in the way that I thought that, that they were going to speak. Um, so um, so as I say, like there's um, there was an element of of experimentation which emerged anyway through the process and I guess I didn't I didn't realize it in part because um, you know I I worked on this piece for overall like the whole project has taken so far at least two years I'm inching now you know in towards kind of two and a half years and um, so some of some of it is just familiarity so I was working with those materials that kind of notational model especially with with rhythm um, in a way that's, that felt totally familiar for me. Like I knew what I was trying to do. I knew what this stuff sounded like. Um, and that hasn't necessarily communicated as, as directly as I thought that it would um, in, in, the, in the notation. And that, I think that comes from the fact that um, the notation in this case, especially related to rhythm, isn't incremental. Like it isn't something that is that has built on existing traditions and existing ways of of working with with the notation of rhythm. Like that's a place where there was this kind of rupture, and um, it takes time to learn how to read that. Like it takes time to learn how to interact with it and understand how you know what it's communicating, what its hierarchies are. Um, so. Um, that's, I suppose, that's the, the place where where the where a kind of um, fundamental, fundamentally experimental approach to music making still exists in in the work. In discussing your creative process, you set up this analogy that I see as having a link to scientific experimentation. The terminology is similar, but what success looks like, and even how we judge that success, can differ. So, with this current experiment. How useful is that analogy, if that was the analogy? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the analogy is exactly right. I think there, there's a way of thinking about the work uh, that is connected to, say, something like the scientific method, of, you know, um, a scientific method of experimentation. And, and again, what's crucial is that the experiment is in the work and not before the work. And um, and that wasn't the goal in this case. Like in this case, the goal was um, to do something that worked straight out of the straight out of the gate. Um, and and I guess um, one of the things that has that has been totally different in this in this process is that I'm revising lots of stuff which I've never ever done before. I have never I've gone back and I fixed things that didn't work on a totally practical kind of logistical level um, or a technical level. But um, 
but I don't I can't think of a time on a piece where I've gone back and changed the material um, or changed the organization of the material um, and in this piece so the day before the premiere um, I cut six minutes worth of music um, and frantically rewrote a whole passage um, in the the day before the, the premiere and there's a whole passage that um, like <laughs> um, literally like standing on stage in the dress rehearsal with two players like rewriting passages that they were going to play like in an hour <laughs> um, and um, and I certainly wouldn't have ever done that in the past. And then I've done this massive revision of, of, of really the whole piece. Um, several of the individual component parts have been, have been fairly substantially rewritten. And there, there's, in the end, I deleted and rewrote um, about 15 minutes worth of music in a 35 minute piece. Um, so um, that's it's a I guess it's a like it's a much more conventional way of, of working a more conventional way of thinking about you know what what a success might be art artistically and and in this case it is does it sound like what I want it to sound like um, whereas let's say in a in a more explicitly scientific environment um, where the experiment is in the performance. Um, the, that is like that is both the outcome and the experiment. There isn't a moment where I listen to that and think, okay, so now I'll go back and I'll fix it. It's that I learn from that experiment and those those things that I learn get in, they get taken with me and they go into the next piece. It's like well, doing a scientific experiment, you don't redo the experiment to to try and get a different result. Like that's a new experiment. <laughs> You've done an experiment. It has either given you the results that you thought were going to happen um, or you know the hypothesis has turned out to not be true um, and you take that on and then you do a new experiment you don't you know th there's no such thing as fixing it like you can't fix it um, whereas what the, you know this project that I've worked on um, over these last couple of years I have had I've gone back and I have fixed it um, to try and make it sound more like I wanted it to sound in the first place You stopped writing music for about two years. What caused that? Was it a singular event? Or what, what were the circumstances that caused that? Yeah. Um, it wasn't an event. It was cumulative. Um, so I suppose in, in part, if there were a specific piece, maybe not an event, but, but um, you know, a, a kind of output, um, it's this piece that I wrote for eight voices called A Painter of Figures and Rooms. Um, and some of it came around the, um, the kind of situation for that, um, for that piece. It was a fairly high profile piece. Um, and uh, the constraints that were involved in, in writing it weren't necessarily the best for, um, let's say, for artistic output. Um, so that's part of it. Um, part of it was that um, I have, over a much longer period, struggled with a, a, a kind of general question about um, listening to my own work. So it's something I've talked about before, but um, let's say with a lot of the music that I really love, especially more, um, more recent music say over the last 25, 30 years, um, it often takes me a long time to actually come to grips with those pieces. Um, so pieces that you know, the first time I hear, I might absolutely hate. <laughs> um, and it might take me two or three or ten listens or sometimes a few years to, to really come to grips with what those pieces are doing, what the materials are, um, how to listen to them. And the thing I've struggled with is, is that okay for my own work? So is it okay to make pieces that I don't yet know how to listen to, um, that I don't yet know how to kind of make sense of. Um, and so for most of my work, going back to, I don't know, say the late 90s, that's been baked into the process of writing. That's been part of the decision making. That's been part of how I talk about what I do and why I do what I do. Um, and for whatever reason, say kind of four years ago, five years ago, I started to question that. Um, whether or not that's really where I want to be um, at this point in my in my life in my career, um, and I don't know, um, at least 
pursuing the possibility of, of trying to write something where you know, I go to the premiere of the piece, it's played, and I think, you know, that was awesome. You know, like that piece was awesome. I sit in the audience and think, I, I loved that. Um, and that's something that I, I often haven't had in, in my own work, so it's something that I've tried to at least explore. Previously, when discussing this latest work, The Wreck of Former Boundaries, you described how, uh, as part of your compositional process, that you would let the material present itself to you. Can you describe a particular instance where that happened? What were you listening for? If you can take us to that place with you. I, yeah, I, I don't really know. Um, and, and I guess that's the thing that's, um, that's difficult in talking about this most recent project, that it's been done in such an intuitive way and a really flexible kind of trial and error way. Um, I am, the, I guess the, 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 the piece for electronics that's part of this Reconformer Boundaries network of, of pieces is, the, is maybe the easiest example, that um, I was, I started with um, some recordings of old pieces of mine I did these kind of distorted improvisations um, using these kind of you know, touch interfaces, you know, kind of stacks of XY pads, um, and listening and making, uh, you know, so listening to what those, you know, what those gestures on these XY pads were doing and trying to get them to do interesting things, um, but not necessarily knowing what that was going to become in the piece, like as, a, as part of a, a kind of larger, larger composition. So, um, yeah, even then from there, like how I decided to chop that audio up and rearrange that audio um, was um, totally instinctive. Um, but I suppose the one thing that was driving it that's, that's interesting is um, I was starting with, in these recordings of old pieces of mine, I was starting with material that was already very highly gestural. Um, the modifications of that with these kind of XY pads was again very highly gestural and it was creating a different kind of gestural language. But then I, I cut those up to make a kind of hyper gesture which better matched what it was that I think I was probably trying to make in the first place. Um, so somehow doing this thing that was highly instinctive and highly intuitive but that generated a kind of like a 60% or 75% accurate version of what I was trying to do. Um, and then it took like that extra layer of um, of labor, like pure nuts and bolts labor of chopping it up and rearranging it and getting it to actually behave the way that I thought it ought to have behaved in the first place. Um, so maybe, I mean, that's one of the things that, that for me has been interesting about this, this whole project is what I've tried to do, and I don't know if it's successful, but what I've tried to do is uh, somehow like tap into um, what I think is a kind of reality of, of what I was aiming to do with a lot of previous work that somehow got squeezed or filtered or um, sometimes led totally astray by working methods that I had set up that were much more procedural and methodological and, um, and kind of constraining. Um, as I say, I'm not sure if that's worked. I don't know if that's been a, a success, but that's what I, I tried to do. Can you elaborate on the thought process and transition that moved your creative focus from those bigger structural architectural concerns and more towards, for instance, your idea of speed and duration being intrinsic to a sound? Like, what's the path? Because I don't yeah. know. It didn't feel like a jump at first. Um, it wasn't intended to be a jump. It was meant to be, um, it was meant to be a truth, <laughs> right? It was meant to be, um, a, a more honest representation of the way I was working with material in the first place. So um, a big part of why the work with rhythm has emerged um, in particular is that I was working with uh, all other elements of musical material, um, in particular ways of, for me, ways of moving, ways of interacting with instruments. Um, uh, and that had kind of built up a, a kind of body, uh, that, that had built up a language of its own but the rhythmic element of that language wasn't actually intrinsic to those movements and intrinsic to the, um, the identity of those, those gestures and those materials. Um, so what I was trying to do was build a way of working with rhythm that, that emerged out of those musical materials rather than something that, I mean, I, I 
have described it as being almost like a kind of scaffolding, like rhythm, rhythm and form and, and tempo and meter in my, in my previous work had existed as like, uh, yeah, as a kind of skeleton or frame from which these other materials were hung. Um, and that's some, that, that's the place maybe where it's a jump, right? Where, um, I had a methodology that was, a, that I, I had learned a way of making pieces um, and then I, I hung my material from that way of making pieces, which didn't seem seem to work. So this whole project has been about somehow trying to upend the way I make pieces so that um, material and method are intertwined. And I think in, in some of my previous work, it hasn't always, always been. Now, I mean, the other side of that is really important, which is in the previous work, um, one of the things that was most important for me is these um, these kind of constraint schemes. So... Um, they work in different ways in different pieces, but it, it stems from a notion that um, invention, real um, artistic invention, happens at points of conflict and constraint. It happens when you're pushed up against a wall. It happens when there's great friction. Um, and those are the places where the things that like are most interesting for me and are most mine um, emerge. And in this recent project, in this effort to kind of open open things up, start with blank pieces of paper, start with, you know, blank doll screens or whatever. Um, those constraints disappeared. And one of the things I've learned over the two years of, two and a half years of working on this project is that actually I need to put some of those constraints back in, um, that those are still somehow part of the, um, part of the crucial element of, of the creative process for, for me. Um, and in fact, as, as I've revised pieces, one of the things that, uh, in this cycle, I've gone back in and superimposed some kind of um, you know, constraint windows and things that kind of push back against the, the material. Um, and I guess then it's a question of making those constraints um, more intrinsic to the material rather than, um, rather than something which emerges out of a kind of um, independent abstract structure. Um, with regards to how this sits in um, your creative life, so I guess it's fair to say that your previous body of work spanned years. Like, what, what was it? Yeah, decades? Okay. 15 years. 15 I would years. Say. Let's say um, roughly a period from 1998 to 2012, 13, something like that. Okay, so this is something new. Can you describe whether or not you see this as... Um, can you impose some kind of form on this kind of uh, trajectory you're on? Yeah, or have I've, yeah, I've joked about it as be, this is like middle period Cassidy. I'm, you know, like I turned 40, <laughs> um, having, you know, different, yeah, my, my life is different than it was. Um, and a lot of the, let's say those works that come out of the 90s, I was, a, you know, I was a first year PhD student in 1998 when I wrote those first pieces and and I would say that there was a pretty clear trajectory from those pieces there's a there's a really important breakthrough for me that happens in 2004 that's the first place that I really start working with tablature notation in a, in a very explicit way um, so let's say there's a kind of 98 to 2004 thing which is the shift from student pieces into work that's more kind of authentically mine um, and then 10 years of working with that um, and uh, I found myself in a place where I had to do something different to 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 keep going. Like I, th I thought I was going to stop, or I was going to do something different. And I, for for now, I've picked doing something, doing something different. Um, it it's uh, it's been really interesting this process. Um, the a lot of the things that I thought were going to be um, solutions have turned out to just pose different problems. Um, so there are places where I found myself actually kind of gravitating back towards an earlier way of, of working, an earlier way of thinking about material, but somehow seeing it through this, um, through a new kind of um, filter, uh, or um, I don't know, somehow um, being more honest about how I was working and how I might work in the, in the future. Uh, at the moment, the, where, I, where I think this is going, um, I think there's likely to be a really dramatic bifurcation. I think I have two paths of work, one of which is going to revolve around electronic music in particular, and um, some ideas about composing for myself to play. I've realized that one of the things I've really enjoyed about the electronic work, and in particular some of the um, improv work that I've been doing with that, it isn't actually the improv that's interesting to me, it's the fact that I'm playing. It's the fact, you know, even if it's 
you know, playing on an iPad um, or playing with, you know, sound in a, in a doll. It's like, that's, I'm, I'm making that sound. And, and that's, that connects back to my life as a conductor and as a singer. And I kind of miss being a musician. Uh, so that's, that's one place that I think it'll go. And then the other, I think, is probably going to shift back into some older ways of thinking about material. I'd like to thank Aaron for his generosity in giving his time for this interview. And I thank you for listening.